you would stand with me still, Father, as we pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for giving us this day. Thank you for giving us fathers to lead us in our lives, Father, and to try their best to teach us about you. Lord, you are the ultimate father, and we worship you this Father's Day, and we thank you for being the loving, kind, kind generous father that you are to us, Lord. We just ask you to continue with your hands of mercy upon us all. Lord, let the ears be open today, hearts be receptive, and minds be understanding of the words that you have chosen to be shared. Those that are traveling today, those that, that we know are with their families or are traveling to, to be with them, maybe their, their own dads or their sons, Lord, be with them and bring them safely back to us. And for those that are here today, we welcome you and we thank you with open arms and we just love you and, and glorify your name, Jesus. In your mighty name we pray, amen and amen. If you would, as you have your seats, watch your eyes. Karen's going to turn on the lights. Rebecca's coming up. Good morning and happy Father's Day to each and every man in this room. We are thankful for all of you. Uh, just a few announcements today. <laughs> if you feel compelled to give, you can give in the basket by the door. You can give online at findtransformation.com slash giving. You can text the word transformation to 830-293-4483 or you can give on our app. If you haven't yet checked into Facebook, if you have a Facebook, go ahead and log on in and uh, check in. Let everybody know where you come to church and so that they can join you because you're a pretty neat person and we're glad to have you. So they might want to come and join too. We are happy to pray with you at any time. You can text the word prayer to 830-293-4483. You can write your prayer request on the back of a transformation card right outside the door and put it in the basket. Um, if you have our app, you can put your prayer request in on our app, but we're also happy to just pray with you in person. I want to tell you how amazing the power of prayer is. I went to a restaurant the other day and a man I do not know prayed over me and he knew exactly what I needed. It was pretty neat. So the power of prayer goes a very, very long way. So I encourage you to do that if you feel spoken to, to do that. Uh, special prayers for the Joneses because Annie would like this baby out of her. Okay, so we're going to pray this baby out of Annie today. <laughs> if you don't have our app yet, you can go to the App Store or Google Play. You are looking for Church by Ministry 1. It's the purple icon with the white cross. Once you have that downloaded, you can search for Transformation Church Kerrville. Uh, like I said, you have access to put a prayer request in. You also have access to all the past sermons. You can sign up for a Bible study, and you can give on that app as well. Uh, we are starting uh, the study Galatians with Miss Barbara. And Miss Barbara right there raising her hand on June 29th. So not this Wednesday, but the following Wednesday. It'll be at 7 o'clock at her house. Um, so get with her if you would like to join. The sign-up is on uh, the app if you would like to sign up there as well. Uh, but just let her know where you're coming or that you are coming and that way she can get you her address. Uh, July 3rd, we are going to have a special freedom message for getting ready for the 4th of July. And next week, it's the undelivered message. But Dad will be delivering the undelivered message. So <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and pass it on back to Dad for today's message. And happy Father's Day to all of you. Thanks, Rebecca. I appreciate that. Oh, my goodness. What am I going to do with my kids? The other one's with me today, too, so I'm so lucky to have her here. You know, she kind of waves in the back of the room. I like that. Um, those who got the message, thanks. I think it's pretty cool that we all can uh, celebrate fathers today. Um, and it's, it's great. And it's an honor to be here, to be your pastor, and to be able to deliver a Father's Day message, especially with both of my girls here today, because that is a blessing to me. Um, I might add in our app a, a baby, I don't know, I, I don't want to say gambling pool, but we could to see when she is going to have this baby. We can all pick numbers. Uh, I gave her mine earlier. I said 6-22-22, which will be, you know, Wednesday. She doesn't want to wait that long, but that's okay. All right, so today we celebrate Father's Day. So for all the men in the room, either you are a father, were a father, or will be someday, we are honoring you 
today. There's no better way to celebrate Father's Day than to hear some stories about kids and their dads. Last year, if you remember, I did some dad jokes and got really um, a nice round of applause. No, I'm just teasing. Uh, they were kind of funny. But anyway, today I'm going to share with you something from the National Center of Fathering. Every year they conduct a Father of the Year essay contest, and that's through the local schools and sponsoring organizations. This, a uh, couple years ago, the, the topic was what my father means to me. And I want to share with you a few of those answers that some of the kids gave. So Darren, a first grader, said, my dad is the best dad ever. I would kiss a pig for him. John, another first grader, said, my dad is a Frito-Lay man. That's an important job because Frito-Lay means chips, which is food. So it's important because you could not live without food. Third grader Jeremiah said, the dad in my life isn't really my dad. He's my grandpa. But he's been like a dad to me since before I was born. I hope that as I get older, grandpa will teach me all the stuff he knows about wood and first aid and everything else he knows about. My grandpa isn't my father, but I wouldn't trade him for all the dads in the world. Nick, a fourth grader, responded with this one. Sometimes as a joke, I'll put my stinky socks in his briefcase so at work the next day, he'll think of me. He's always at the concerts and plays that I'm in, even though he lives about an hour away. Joni, a fifth grader, she said, you know what else my dad does? He braids my hair. Caitlin, are you sure you didn't write this one? Because I used to do that for her all the time. Uh, I am the only girl I know whose dad braids her hair. I think that's a perfect dad. Thanks, Kate. He already is the world's greatest dad to me. I just wanted everyone to know that. And finally, Jody, a sixth grader, said, one time I had an assembly and I was a soloist and my dad was in the first row. And after my song, I smiled at my dad and my dad smiled back and started crying. That was the best thing I ever saw. So what I'd like you to do is right now where you're at, think about your own dad this morning and maybe if he's living or gone, think of something that he did that inspired you. And if he's still around, I want you to give him a call today. I just tell him thanks for that. And if he's not, share it with somebody else so you can honor him that way this Father's Day. So this morning I want to share a lesson with you from the well-known parable of the prodigal son. It's a story about a younger son who leaves his father behind and an older son who didn't understand what relationship that the father was all about. And the focus of the story is on the great and gracious love of the Father. So let's all turn to the 15th chapter of Luke, and we're going to look at verses 11 through 32. The word says, Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that, that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and against heaven and against, or I have sinned against heaven and against you. If I am no longer worthy to be called your son, make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put him and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. 
When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when, his son of, but when the son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. There are seven aspects of this message this morning, this Father's Day message that I want to share with you today. And interestingly enough, they all begin with the letter R, so it's going to probably be easy for you to focus on this. Even though the main focus of the prodigal son, for many, is the ungracious brother, the assumptions are made about the prodigal's father are very enlightening. Let me point some things out. We can make the assumptions about the background of the father to the prodigal son. It seems that he had worked hard and had saved money. Therefore, he had an estate. Maybe the world would be a better place if more men had that attitude today. Work hard, build something up. Sadly, there are many men who seem to have no desire to provide for or to protect their families. We can assume also that this father had trained his sons in mo as most Jewish men did. The father was probably a man who wanted his children to walk with God. He had probably trained his sons in the Hebrew scriptures, their prayers, and godly living. And he would have been active in their practical training as well. He would have probably hoped that his children had learned good things from him, just as I do mine. Yet, right at the beginning of the story of the prodigal son, we see the very first R, rebellion. In Luke 15, 11, 22, or 11 through 12, again, Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to the father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. You see, when the younger son asked for his share of the father's estate, his request was legal according to Old Testament law, but it was rebellious the way he did it. See, Old Testament law would have stated that the younger son was entitled to one third of the father's estate, and that's because there was two brothers and the father. See, at that time, women got nothing, so take the estate, divide it by the three males, he would have had one third. It was acceptable for the man, for the father, to divide this estate prior to his death because that was the law. But it was considered rebellious when a younger son asked for it first. Why? What did it mean in the culture of that time? So glad you asked, because I'd be standing here dumbfounded if you didn't. It meant that the son was basically saying, Father, I wish you were dead. I'm tired of you, and I want to be free from your control over my life. The younger son's attitude was marked by sinfulness and selfishness. He had decided that he knew better. He knew more about how to live his life than his father did. How many of us have raised teenagers? Maybe your children, your grandchildren. They think they know better than you. Nothing changes over the years, does it? Yet this father in the parable, this father shows love and grace by allowing his son to choose his own path. He gives the son the required portion of his own life's work. It seems like the younger son wanted what his father could give him but did not want his father. You see, people who place their faith in God, the, the people who refuse to give their life over 
to the Lordship of Jesus Christ are living the same way the Son did. Even the people who call themselves Christians yet ignore God until they want something are living in rebellion. They may pray, Father God, give me, but only want what the Father gives them. They don't want Him. My prayer is that we may never live or behave the way this rebellious son did toward our loving Father. That brings us to the second R, recklessness. Did you go backwards? Nope. Did I have rebellion in there twice? Yep. Wow. The second R is recklessness, not rebellion. Don't know how I did that. Found in Luke 15, 13, it says, Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. This distant country that we talk about can represent any place that we, meaning you and me, have tried to go to get away from God. Have you ever done that? We all have. In modern psychology, if we had a psychologist here today and they analyzed this parable, they might say that the prodigal left home because his father oppressed him. Or that he was sheltered from life by his overly protective mother. Or maybe there were poor financial prospects in a profit-driven society. Or possibly they, the blame could be focused on the government who should have provided more facilities to occupied troubled teenagers. Follow me so far. Others might argue that the rabbis were not strict enough while this kid was growing up. He was forced to go to synagogue every Saturday, and now he was rebelling because of that. Have you ever noticed how often times many people try to blame other people instead of taking personal responsibility? A person does something wrong and then defends themselves by blaming other people for their own actions. The parable says that the son squandered his wealth. The son, despite his father's goodness, made a choice about how he would live his life. It was a bad choice, but it was his choice. It's that simple. And it's still what happens today. Each and every one of us has free will. We all have free choice. The younger son chose to live by the worldly philosophies that say, enjoy today. Go for it. Get all you can while you can. Life's a party. Have a blast. I don't know about your family, but in some families, grown children are never viewed as adults by their parents. Sometimes even siblings treat each other, their brothers and sisters, like they were still in childhood. One thing is clear here though, is that the father in this story, in this parable, he respected the free will and the choices of both of his children. Has anyone ever read Hercule Perot or the Miss Marple stories? Familiar with them? Okay. They often involve wealthy families that have adult children who do nothing except live off of their parents. Then someone in the family eventually gets tired of being controlled and they kill off one of their elderly parents to get their inheritance. In this parable, the, the prodigal son he doesn't have to put poison in his father's teeth. He simply asked for it, and his dad gave it to him. But here's another truth. It, it may have broken his father's heart, but he had to let his son be reckless. That brings us to the third R, which I hope I did correctly. Reflection. I did. There we go. So the third R is reflection. Looking again at Luke 14, I'm sorry, 15, 14 through 17, it says, after he had spent everything, 
There was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. The truth is that sometimes we all need to be brought low to realize that what we already have. Have you ever experienced that in your own life? Far too often we look for all the wrong things in all the wrong places when our Heavenly Father has already provided us with everything that we need. In that far off country, I still keep trying to do that with my arm and I can't. In that far off country, the younger son went, that he went to, nobody cared whether he had what he needed for his day-to-day -day existence. They didn't know who he was. They didn't care about him at all. And many in the world today are only interested in what's in it for them. What will I get in return? What do you have to offer me? You see, when that son was in need, it was as if everyone else just looked the other way. He needed food, and nobody fed him. He needed clothes, and nobody clothed him. You see, without his wealth, without his extravagance, without his wild living, he was abandoned. I bet he had a lot of friends when he was doling out the money. But then the money dried up. There were no government handouts. There were no benefits. He wasn't even allowed to eat a bowl of pig food. That would have stopped him from starving to death. When the son squandered his wealth, he had no thought about the consequence. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? How many times do we do things without thinking it all the way through. Doesn't mean it's gonna be a bad choice because you make an educated decision. The son lived in the moment and he had no thought about the future. The son had reflected on his circumstance and when he did, he realized that repentance was the only solution. So therefore, our fourth R is repentance. Yes. Let's take a look at the scripture to see how that fits in. Luke 15, 18, 20, first line of 20. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. You see, repentance, I've talked about this before from right here. Repentance is not being sorry for where you are and staying there. Repentance is being sorry for what you've done and turning away from it. Going back to where you should be. Getting up and doing something about it. That is repentance. The biblical definition of repentance is like someone traveling the wrong direction, realizing it, and turning to go the right way. Repentance involves self-examination. You're the only one that may know your secret sins. That's why they're secret. But you're the only one that can repent and turn from them as well. Determination to change is a key factor. You have to want to change. And action, it requires you to make that decision and choose to go another way. Another great truth here, though, is the compassion of the Father. He was eager to forgive. Are you? Are you just as eager to forgive as this Father was? See, when someone is truly repentant for what they did or what they've done, especially if it is something against us personally. 
we must be generous with our grace. In this story, we see that the father did not withhold grace from his son. The son knew that he needed to repent, and the father wanted to be reconciled to his son. Which brings us to the fifth R, reconciliation. Pay attention to what this verse says, and imagine, if you will, the emotion that the father is feeling during this time. Again, Luke 15, 20 through 24, the rest of, of 20, it says, but while he was still a long way off, the father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to, him, to, said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Church, when the son repented, when the son turned around and began his journey home, the father was waiting and watching and in love, the father ran to meet his child. When we have wronged someone, we need to ask for forgiveness. We need to do whatever we can to make reconciliation possible. We need to take responsibility for our bad choices. We need to understand what we have done that is wrong. And we need to stop trying to justify our bad choices. You see, in Christ, we are forgiven. And as those who have been forgiven, it is right and appropriate for us to forgive others. Unfortunately, not everyone is gracious to forgive. Notice this. The the father ran to his son and hugged and kissed him before the son said a single word. He just knew. The son didn't ask for forgiveness. The father freely gave it before his son opened his mouth. Some people think that they can protect themselves from future hurt to gain control over not forgiving the actions of another person. But this father, the father in this story, was so eager for reconciliation that when the opportunity came, he ran towards it. He didn't wait for it. He went out and got it. The son returned with a repentant, humbled, contrite spirit, and the father gladly receives his son and restores him into the family. He gives him a robe to replace those old, smelly garments that he had been wearing for who knows how long. He gave him a ring, which was the family seal, the crest of the family. He gave him shoes, because at that time, only slaves went barefoot. And there was great rejoicing when the whole household threw a celebration. You see, the fatted calf was an animal that was set aside to feed the best friends and visitors that came. They saved that for the celebration of great importance. And today was the day. There was clear cause for a celebration. The father's words were clear in verse 24. He said, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. That was an amazing reaction, wouldn't you agree? Sadly though, the older brother, he didn't react the same way, did he? Which is what happens 
when we run across the sixth R, reaction. Let's see how Luke describes the older brother's reaction to his brother being home. Again, let's look at Luke 15, 25, and 32. It says, meanwhile, the older son was in the field. He was working. He was doing his job. Well, he came near the house. He heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Now, I don't know about you or me. I wouldn't call somebody else to ask him. I'd go see myself. But he wasn't that curious. So he called the servant and asked. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, you're always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. You see, in some ways, the, it seems that the older brother was really no better than the younger brother used to be. The older son had a resentful relationship with his father, and he refused to acknowledge his own brother. Notice he says he called him this son of yours. He didn't say, my brother. It seems the older brother has no joy in being part of the family. It seems he was only grudgingly obedient. Listen to this. Just as the father went out to meet the prodigal son, he goes out to meet the older son. He wouldn't go in, so the father came to him as well. The older son who remained at home, the firstborn, he was bitter. He was mad that his father treated the renegade younger brother so well. In essence, the father did treat them differently. He did. Because they were different people with different needs. So the next time you see someone being blessed, by the Father. And you complain. Think of this story. We all have different needs. I used to tell my girls growing up, Karen and I both would, would tell them, when something didn't go their way, when they weren't elected for an office in school or at 4-H or FFA, maybe that other person needed this now more than you. Think about that. He treats us all the same, yet different. This was a case of comparing apples to oranges. The father loved both boys equally. The father was gracious and kind in his treatment of both of his sons. But to truly understand the parable, we have to read what was written earlier in the chapter. And it provides us with the last R word for today, relevance. So listen close and see if you can pick it up. In Luke 15, verses 1 through 10. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around near Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he 
joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and he says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven for one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Did you hear it? Did you see the relevance between us and the story of the prodigal son? You see, Jesus is letting us know that our Father, God, cares about people who are lost. Our Father, God, he doesn't want anyone to perish. Those of us that are here that already believe who he is and for what he says and, and we know beyond a shadow of a doubt we will rejoice with him in heaven, our job is not done. Our Father, God, he wants the lost to become found. And our Father, he knows that all we can do on our own is do harm to ourselves. But what joy our Father feels when the lost become found. In fact, Scripture said, all of heaven rejoices. The man in our story had two sons. They were both sinners. The younger son was rebellious, reckless, disrespectful, and morally decadent. And by the way, we looked up the word this week, and it does not mean what we all think it does when we say that's a decadent piece of chocolate. Right, Karen? Said I had the wrong word until we looked up the definition. The older son was jealous, had a lack of love for his father and his brother, and he was false and selfish in his motives for serving the father. He was egotistical, he was ungrateful, and he was blind to his own sinfulness. Yet the father in this story, he was loving and he offered his grace and mercy to both of his sons. In the two sons, there are two contrasts. When the openly rebellious person comes to their right mind, when they turn and go to the Father, they know for certain that they don't deserve God's grace and goodness. While those who pretend to be devoted to the Father, believe that they deserve their rightful inheritance and believe they're good enough to deserve God's grace and goodness. Friends, none of us deserve God's grace and goodness. Romans 3.10 says, There is no one righteous. No, not one. Same chapter, verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I haven't met anyone, myself included, who lives a sinless life other than the day I met Jesus. The Father loves us and he offers us his mercy and his grace. To the rebellious, disobedient, prodigal, the message is, come home, the Father loves you. 
to the prideful, self-righteous, older brother, the message is, come into the house and enjoy the feast. The Father loves you. Our Heavenly Father did what was necessary to provide a way of salvation from our sins. We have a wonderful hope and a wonderful promise in the grace and mercy of our living Father. Each of us experience the power of our Father's love in our lives because He loves us. Happy Father's Day. Amen. You'll join me in prayer. Father, we come to you today and we thank you for giving us words of encouragement that you love us, you care for us, whether we are rebellious, as long as we turn and go back to you, you are waiting with open arms before we even say a word. You are there to hold us, to love us, to give us mercy and grace. Lord, you also show us that if our pride gets in the way, if our selfishness gets in the way, we just need to turn again back to you to come back into your house and you will love us and you will care for us and you will give us the mercy and grace that we need. Father, your whole story is about love. Loving you and loving others. That's all we want to teach, Father is that no one is sinless, but only those who know you are forgiven. And because of that forgiveness, we have the opportunity to spend eternity with you. So with all the eyes closed and head bowed as we're in this room today, if there's anyone in here that does not have that assurance, that does not realize that they get to live with Jesus in heaven because they've asked for his forgiveness. I ask you to raise your hand right where you're at. No need to move or come down front, nothing like that at all. For the rest of us, as we enter into communion today, let's make ourselves holy and pure in front of our loving Father. So if you would, just repeat after me. Father God, thank you for allowing me to turn to you in repentance. Cleanse my heart, Lord. Allow me to be a vessel to be used by you to bring the lost to salvation. Cleanse my heart today as I prepare to have communion with you. Keep me pure and holy. Watch over me this week and guide me to your righteousness. In Jesus' name, amen. So everybody have their elements? Anybody need any? Karen's going to grab some real quick. If you would, pull back the layer and take out the wafer. And as I do every week, I'm going to keep reminding you until you can repeat this over and over and over again if anyone ever questions you on why do you have communion. Because it's a time that we get to rejoice. It's a time we get to celebrate and have a meal with our Heavenly Father. Because Jesus did it the night before he was crucified for us. He took the bread in the upper room with his disciples. And after breaking the bread, he said to them, This is my body, which will be given up for you. They didn't know what he meant. But he did it anyway. And he said, every time you take of this, remember me. Partake. Then he took the cup of wine. And after giving thanks, he said, this is my blood. The blood of the new covenant. See, at that point, Jesus did away with the sacrificial lambs. They were no longer needed. He knew that the blood that would be shed on the cross of Calvary the very next day would be enough for the repentance of sins for all of mankind, past, 
present, and future. That's mine. That's yours. That's your children's, your grandchildren's. All they have to do is believe. But he told them that every time they drink of this cup, to remember him. Let me pray for a moment. Father God, thank you. Thank you for sharing your son with us. Thank you for being our father. And we don't need this day to remember to honor you. We should honor you with our lips and our praises and our actions each and every day. Each and every day should be Father's Day for a believer. But as we honor our earthly fathers today, as we rejoice in our time we had with them or, or whoever that father figure is in our lives, Lord, we thank you. Thank you for giving us the words to say, the wisdom and the knowledge. Lord, I thank you for those that are here today, those that choose to worship with us, that choose to follow you. And I ask you to continue to bless their lives and all that they do and bring them safely back again next week. In Jesus' name, amen.